Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring luminaries in the career, leadership, financial, entrepreneurial, and wellness fields. I know you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I'm so excited to welcome my very special guest to the show, Dr. Lois Frankel. Lois, welcome to the show. Thank you, Caroline. I really appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So I have been a longtime fan of yours, and I want to tell our listeners about you. You are the president of Corporate Coaching International. You're also a best-selling author, executive coach, and an internationally recognized expert in the field of leadership development for women, a topic very close to my heart. And of course, I know many of our listeners have heard you and seen you on Larry King Live, The Tavis Smiley Show, the Today Show, CNBC, PBS, and many others. And you have some extraordinary New York Times bestselling books, including Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office, Nice Girls Don't Get Rich, Nice Girls Just Don't Get It, and your other books include See Jane Lead and Stop Sabotaging Your Career, all of which are on my bookshelf and highly recommended to people with whom I work. But I want to start our conversation, Lois, about Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office because you're in the 10th year anniversary edition and some new and exciting things in the book. Tell us more. Yeah, you know, it's been really quite a ride. I had no intention of doing a 10th anniversary edition of Corner Office. But about two years ago, I did a survey of women around the world and asked them what their experiences were in the workplace. And I also asked for their ages. And I expected that the younger women would say things were pretty good and that the older women would say, hey, things haven't changed that much. To my surprise, across generations, women were saying, things haven't changed that much. Yeah. And it was really kind of discouraging for me because I thought, we've come so far. There's been 50 years of civil rights legislation. You know, so much has changed. But when it comes to women really achieving their full career potential, there's still so many obstacles. So I was really compelled to write something that would help women overcome these obstacles. Good for you. And it it is continues to be a global international success. Am I right in that it's been translated into over 101 different languages? No, uh, it's actually been uh, translated into 25 over 25 languages worldwide. Wow. And, and yes, internationally, it's really interesting as I go to different countries Women around the world share the same challenges. We may, you know, worship different gods and we may look different and wear different garb. But the fact is, is to some greater or lesser degree, we share the same challenges. So true. So I want to go through a couple of my favorites. My my original copy is dog-eared and highlighted and underlined. And of course, my new copy is becoming the same way. And I just cherish this as such a valuable resource for me. But I want to tap a few points that are so, so resonant to our listeners. Don't ask permission. Inform others of your intentions. Can you speak to that? Yeah. One of the things is that men don't ask permission. They ask forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Every time a woman asks permission, she relegates herself to the level of a child. We expect children to ask permission. We don't expect adults to ask permission. Now, we don't want to be seen as a loose cannon either. So it's not as if I suggest, hey, look, just do what you want. Go off on your own. Don't tell anybody what you're doing. Just do it. I'm not suggesting that. I think that we need to inform But that's far different from asking permission. If there's a new idea that I have that I want to chase down, I might tell my boss, look, I just want to give you a heads up that I'm going to be working on this for the next two weeks. If there's anything else you need, let me know. But in the meantime, here's what I'll be doing. Now, I think it's appropriate to say that as opposed to would it be all right with you? If I spent some of my time doing X, Y, Z, you know, the former is really much more powerful Uh and adult like than the latter. Absolutely. So important. And I think a very important lesson for young women who are emerging into leadership roles as well. What what I love about this particular book is it's so accessible to women wherever they are in their career and life trajectory. These are lessons we can learn early on. 
Absolutely. As a matter of fact, just this morning, I got an unsolicited email from a woman who said, you know, I'm reading your book and I'm just starting my career. And wow, there's so many pitfalls that I have to watch out for. And it was really heartwarming. Oh, that's great. That's great. So here's another favorite of mine. Stop apologizing. My goodness, as women, we over, over apologize. Give us your take on that. Yeah, you know, there's over, there's about 130 mistakes in the book. And if you make just one of them, it's not going to be a career buster, but it's when you start putting them together that we really diminish our credibility and our self-confidence. And when it comes to apologizing, again, this is something that women do, but men don't do. I mean, men have to make a pretty egregious mistake to <laughs> apologize. And even then, they usually don't. They don't do but it. Yeah. women as apologize for every little thing, even when it's not their fault. So, for example, if someone gives them wrong wrong instructions or unclear instructions or no instructions at all. And they go off and they do something and then they find, you know, they did it wrong. They didn't do it the way that the person was anticipating. They say, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Let me do this again. Again, you combine this with asking permission and using a, and a, you know, a number of the other mistakes. And all of a sudden you're not very powerful. So rather than apologize, my suggestion is you simply say, why don't you tell me what it would look like if I did it the way you want it? And I'll go back and do it. No apologies, no guilt, just straightforward. Excellent. And I'm so happy to hear you say no guilt. That's such an important part of this process. So Lois, you are such an experienced executive coach. How would you coach a woman who is an over apologizer to start down a different path in her communication? I would tell her first to start counting every time she apologizes. Nice. And that's throughout the day. You know, it, it, what's really interesting to me is, you know, sometimes you're around a corner and you kind of bump into someone. You know, if you bump into a woman, it's like she's already saying, you know, I'm sorry. You bump into <laughs> a man, he just kind of looks at you like there's something wrong with you. So there, there's plenty of ways that you can count those apologies during the course of the day. The first thing is to make yourself aware of when you're doing it. And the second thing is often to replace that with something else. It's much easier to change behavior when I replace it with something else. So for example, if I round a corner and I, I bump into somebody, you know, rather than saying, I'm sorry, maybe I just nod my head or maybe I just smile, but replace it with something else. And then the third thing is ask people to give you a sign when you're doing it. Nice. You know, if you have a yeah, if you have a good friend at work or, you know, a friend at home or your, your husband or your significant other, you can say, you know, I want you to just give me a little sign each time I apologize because I want to catch myself and stop. So those are three tips I would give. And I love that because you're you're enlisting accountability masters, right, to keep you in check. And I think that's such important an important resource. Well done. You know, segueing to the counting, right? You suggest too that we count to three before answering a question or responding to anything, even if we have the answer on the tip of our tongue. Tell me more about that. Yeah, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the pause makes us look more thoughtful. Mm. Part of what we want to do is we want to manage people's impression of us. And part of that impression you want to be is this person is really thoughtful. Again, I'll use the term loose cannon. She doesn't speak loosely. She thinks about what she says. You want that to be part of your personal brand. So just by counting to three, and it seems like an eternity to you, but to anybody else, it really is not an eternity. Um, that manages that impression. The second thing is that it gives you the opportunity, because that's all you need is about three seconds, to order your thoughts. Because you want to speak in headlines. You want the first thing out of your mouth to be memorable. You want it to be direct. You want it to be to the point. And if you give yourself about three seconds and think, okay, if I'm going to be interrupted in 30 seconds, what do I have to say that will be memorable? You're more likely to speak in that headline. So it just buys you some time to be able to collect your thoughts and say them in a cogent way. Brilliant. You know, I think it's also important to say, too, that as an American culture, and this is a broad 
broad brush here, we tend to respond so quickly. And the power of the pause, as you said, is so important. I don't believe we utilize that enough. So thank you for giving women permission to say, take your time. Yeah, take your time. Um, Or even you can say something like, let me think out loud for a minute. If you're asked a question that, gee, that, that came out of the blue and I'm not sure what to say and I feel kind of nervous, say, well, you know, let me think out loud for a minute. I've done this from the stage in front of 500 people mm-hmm. and said, you know, I've never been asked that question. Let me think out loud for a minute. That clues, clues people that I'm not going to give the perfect answer. Well, it also gives them time to say, look, she's she's contemplating, she's processing, and that's okay. That's not an offense, right? That's part of the package, and I, I love your authenticity. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Lois, you have this great quote, and I'm going to share it with our listeners. Whereas in many instances, women have broken through the glass ceiling, there remains a glass treehouse, that place where the upper tier of senior executives and directors of companies reside. Tell me more. Yeah, you know, the glass ceiling is really around getting women into management positions and maybe even senior management positions. But the glass treehouse is really the CEO jobs, boards of directors, people who are really have the ear of the decision makers. The glass treehouse is uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi broke through mm-hmm. the glass treehouse, becoming mm-hmm. Speaker of the House, um, becoming senior women in political forums, running countries. That's the glass treehouse. And we just don't have enough women in the glass treehouse to really create a significant difference. I mean, if you think about it, another place that the glass treehouse is, is um, the Supreme Court. Right. Well, you know, now we have three women on the Supreme Court out of nine, which is actually pretty good. It's not bad. But as I've been saying to people, I will know we will really have made progress when we have more women than men in these places, not equal numbers. Because when we have more women than men, we'll know we're really gender blind. Beautifully put. So let me ask, how do we solve this problem? And I know that's a massive conversation that we could spend hours on, but you're so insightful and you are one of the preeminent uh, leadership coaches for women. So how do we move the needle? Yeah, for me, moving the needle really starts with me. You know, I worked in equal, when I say me, I mean all of us, collective Mm -hmm. with us. Um, You know, I worked in equal employment opportunity early in my career for the uh, oil company Arco. And I realized then that I was kind of carrying a flag of equality. But most people don't carry the flag. It's just not what most of us do. Most people aren't going to be Lois Frankel writing these books, going out and talking to women. But every single one of us can make a change in our behavior that collectively, as we reach the critical mass, makes a difference in society. Can you imagine if every woman who knew she was underpaid, went in and negotiated for a raise and got the money that she had earned and deserved, how that would shift the economy. Oh, it's incredible. Oh, absolutely. But what happens is women can't do it alone. You know, it's often why I say when women come to me and say, you know, I have this really awful boss and he really demoralizes all of us and I want to go to HR and I want to talk about it. I always say, you know, do not go by yourself because one voice can be dismissed. Three voices aren't going to be overlooked and five voices are going to be listened to. And so the same thing in society that we each need to be that voice. So, you know, just to, you know, uh, quote Gandhi, we need to be the change we wish to see. And then we need to take women along with us. Each one teach one. If each one of us taught one woman how to stand up for herself, communicate with impact, leave a bad relationship, and that can include a marriage or a job. If each one of us did that, we would create that necessary critical mass. 
Each one, teach one. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. I thank you so much for giving our women listeners permission to to activate, right, and to carry their own flag, because it will be a collective success if we all raise our voices. Well done. Lois, I'm inspired by you because you're, one of your professional values is to give back. Tell us more about that. You've got a, a lovely uh, feature on your website about how you are giving back. Yeah, I just really, really believe in the maxim to those who much is given, much is expected. And I have been given so much in my lifetime. Um, you know, I, I didn't come from a family of wealth or or an educated family. And yet somehow I was able to achieve all that for myself. And I feel like it's my responsibility now to give some of that back and help other people achieve it as well. And two of the ways that I've done that is creating nonprofit organizations. Almost 30 years ago, I started an organization called MOST, Motivating Our Students Through Experience. And that was aimed at providing inner city middle school girls with professional women mentors so that they could see a, a way out of wherever they were living, so that they could see that they could become professional too. They could stay in school, stay off drugs, not get pregnant. And they could. And, and the way that they could do that is if they had a mentor really looking out for them. And so that was started almost 30 years ago. And, you know, many of those girls now did go to college and they've graduated and we're very proud of them. And then the second organization I started was more recently, and it was really in response to my own challenge with breast cancer. Uh, in 2005, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and because I had let it go so long, it wasn't a particularly aggressive kind of cancer, but it, it had to be treated aggressively because you know, everything and everybody was more important than me going and ha getting my mammogram. And I knew something was wrong. And I kept, and I still kept c canceling the appointments, which was really foolish. Um, and one day I was sitting home uh, with no hair and feeling kind of sick and feeling sorry for myself and saying, how can you feel sorry for yourself? You have resources, you have money, you have support, you have your own business. It doesn't matter if you miss a day or two or three of work. It's not going to make a difference in the world. But what about those women who work at McDonald's, who clean our homes, who clean our hotel rooms, who are selling churros on the street corners of Los yeah. Angeles? They miss one day of work and they can't pay the rent. So I thought to myself, when I'm feeling better, I'm going to do something about that. And I did. I started a nonprofit called Bloom Again Foundation, and we provide financial assistance to working women who live at the poverty level uh, to pay for living uh, essentials like rent, utilities, things like that, food, when they experience a medical challenge. And it's it's just been really heartwarming to partner with other nonprofits in the community who know these women, know their situations, know they are deserving, and they just need a hand to get back on their feet. That's extraordinary. What a great story. And again, your incredible mission to empower women on every level. Thank you for sharing that. So you've got this incredible new video project for Women's History Month. Tell me about that. Oh, yeah. You know, I this was really fun for me, actually. People say, why'd you do this? And I said, one was because I had to, and the other was because it was fun. <laughs> and, you know, um, I heard that song Brave by S Sarah Bareilles, mm -hmm. and it kept going through my head and going through my head. And what I pictured with it were all the brave women in history, because we really stand on their shoulders. These were not, many of them were not educated women. Harriet Tubman, was not an educated woman. Right. Rosa Parks, not particularly educated. You know, so when I thought about all these women, I thought they were the brave ones. And so I set out to put together a little retrospective of brave women in modern history, not so much ancient history, because people said to me, well, why isn't Cleopatra there? And why isn't, <laughs> I said, you know, you know what? At some you can only point, go far back, right? <laughs> go so yeah, far the back. The song's only three minutes. <laughs> So um, so I put this together and I tried to make it all inclusive. You know, I tried to include people from around the world, people who were different, whether they were um, uh, of different color, ethnicity, uh, sexual preference. Or, um, and so I just uh, included everybody and I put it into this video and I put it on YouTube. So if people go to Dr. Lois Frankel YouTube, they'll see the brave video Wonderful. and it, it's really a lot of fun. And I hope people will share it because I want to inspire women 
by having them understand you can be brave too. Just do Brilliant. it. Brilliant. Well, I will be sure to share that with, with my network. Wonderful. So what's new and exciting for you these days? As, as if I have to ask, there's always so many wonderful things going on in your world, but what are you looking forward to these days? Well, you know, what I'm looking forward to most is my tra- continuing my travels around the world doing keynote speaking. I've just spent uh, most of last month uh, speaking to college groups, uh, college seniors, women, about what they're going to need to expect in their careers. I'll be going to Australia in a few months, going back there. I've already been several times, and I just love the women of Australia because they're like little sponges. They just soak <laughs> everything up. I'll be going there talking about nice girls. And so for me, getting the word out about what can you do to empower yourself and empower others. That's really what I, what I want to be doing with the rest of my career. I'm not doing so much coaching anymore because it, it kind of keeps me, it anchors me. It keeps me in one place. Sure. And then, it, yeah, because if you're going to do it right, you really want to be available to your clients. So if I really want to be able to go out and do these things, then I somehow need to um, have a little bit more mobility. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm also writing a novel and it's, a, it's kind of a um, historical fiction novel about Amelia Earhart, and it's designed to be also be empowering for women. Uh, and the premise of it is that Amelia Earhart didn't die, that she chose to live in obscurity and why. Wow. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a book about empowerment for women by telling the tale. Good for you. So is it, is it an interesting experience in flexing different writing muscles now, writing a novel? Oh, Caroline, it is so, <laughs> it is so hard. It's like I, I can crank out um, nonfiction very easily because that's how my brain works. Yeah. It's like I think in bullets, I think right. in uh, outlines. Yeah, I, that I can do easily. This has been quite a challenge. I've been working on it for a while, but I am committed to getting this thing done because I believe in it and I love it. W- one of the problems was I did have some interest in it from a filmmaker, but then uh, that movie Amelia Earhart with Hilary Swank came out and it right. tanked and all of a yeah. sudden... Nobody was interested in oh. Amelia Earhart. So I'm, I'm just waiting for there to be a little bit of distance between that. And then we bring it up again because everybody's yeah. always interested in oh, it. Oh, that's exciting. Well, I wish you great success. What a joy to have you on. You're such an inspiration. And I have to say, it's so exciting to read the 10th anniversary of Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. But I want you to share how we can follow you online, how we can book you to speak at conferences and engagements. How do we find you online, Lois? It's pretty easy if you if you Google Dr. Lois Frankel and make sure you put the doctor in there because there is a Lois Frankel who is um, I think she's a state legislator in Florida. Ah, so okay. uh, if you Google Dr. Lois Frankel, I will come up. I have a website, drloisfrankel.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Lois Frankel, and of course I have a Facebook page, Dr. Lois Frankel. So you can find me in all kinds of ways, and I would love for people to follow me because I provide uh, on Twitter I provide coaching tips every single day. And you do, I must say, because I subscribe to all of your social media channels and I am the beneficiary of some wonderful career and development wisdom from you. So thank you for that. Thank you. What a joy to have you on. It was such a pleasure catching up and hearing about all the great things that you're doing. I wish you continued success and I hope to get to see you in person sometime soon. I would love that. And thank you for all you are doing for women, Caroline. Thank you, my dear. You be well, and we will talk soon. I want to thank our listeners for tuning into Your Working Life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care. (laughs) 